Okay, warm up nine. And we can go into quiz statistics. The first question here, which and I, sh I should have said, I wrote meningi, this it should says the tough outermost, either meninges is the plural or meninx is the single. So actually meningi does not exist as a word like I wrote it there. I should, I should have fixed that. But you know what I'm talking about. Um, which of the membranes covering the brain is the tough outermost one. Obviously the Dora Mater, most people got that. Pia is the one that's really delicate right against the neural tissue itself. You know, arachnoid is the one with the little fibers that has that subarachnoid space where the CSF is filling in and it's kind of surrounding the outside of the brain. Um, CSF, again, what is the, if we were going to start from the beginning, where it's created to where it ultimately ends up, where is CSF originally formed? In all the ventricles from the choroid plexus. Exactly, in the choroid plexus is within the ventricles inside the brain. Um, and then it's flowing around inside the brain. Where does it go next? Through those apertures or aqueducts? It goes through those little apertures in the fourth ventricle, the median and lateral apertures. Where does it end up? Going through those like arachnoid granulations into the. Before that. Thing. So if you pour out of those apertures, where are you filling into? The subarachnoid space. There you're filling in the subarachnoid space. So now we have the CSF. Um, covering the outside of the brain. And then what happens then? Does it flow someplace next? Where does it flow from the subarachnoid space? All the way around the spinal cord, like, or well, in the subarachnoid space, but then through those arachnoid granulations. Yeah, through those arachnoid granulations, also called the arachnoid villi, and where do those lead into? They don't lead to the uh, vein circulation. The um, dural sinus. So yeah, they eventually will, but what's um, what's what's the other uh, place they pass on their way there? The sinus. The dural sinus. Yeah, those dural sinuses. So they, the arachnoid villi or arachnoid granulations, they drain into those dural sinuses, those little canals that are within the dura mater, and then those ultimately all drain down into the jugular vein which then just dumps it back into your regular venous circulation. Um, which the answer here is drained into the venous circulation via the jugular vein. Um, so you should definitely be aware of that circulation of CSF. And, you know, again, it's constantly being produced and constantly being drained. And if there's something that blocks that, then it's dangerous. You start building up pressure inside your brain. They have to put in little shunts or drains and things to make sure that that flow works properly. And we're gonna see a, a number of examples of things where you have a constant production and constant drainage. When we get into the eyeball um, a little bit from now, we'll see a similar thing. You know, your eye is constantly making aqueous humor in the ciliary bodies which then flows around, but then has to get drained or else you're gonna end up getting glaucoma. So you're gonna get all this pressure building up in your eyeball. Um, so there's, there's a variety of things we're gonna see where there's like a constant production and constant drainage of some nutritive fluid. Um, what else? Embryonic hindbrain. Um, most people got this for the most part, but didn't get all three parts. There's three major um, adult structures that end up developing from the hindbrain, or what we call the rhombencephalon, if you're getting fancier. What are the three main adult brain structures that we end up with? 
the pons medulla oblongata. So the pons and medulla oblongata, most people got those. And then there's one other one that's, you kind of forget about it sometimes because it's kind of hanging off the back of the brain. Cerebellum? The cerebellum. So the cerebellum is also from the rhombencephalon of the hindbrain. You'll make sure you read these questions. Well, one person answered this. Um, you know, it says, which structures develop for the embryonic hindbrain? And they wrote the forebrain, the <laughs> midbrain, and the, it's like, what, what? It's like, yeah, so. So is the cerebellum part of the brain stem, or is it? I think it's more like kind of attached to the back of the brain stem. When I think of brain stem, I think of kind of the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. Okay. Um, you know, and there are probably, yeah, I mean, there, you, you might have different conventions depending who you're talking to. Remember this, at some level, all of this is something people make up and they decide what are, what do these terms mean? And sometimes those terms mean different things if you're in different groups or they change meaning over time. Um, or they even have different, different uh, meanings amongst um, a similar group, just depending on what people's preferences are for things. So, um, this one, people, a number of people didn't quite get this. So nerves, the official definition of a nerve those are those cables, bundles of axons running in the PNS. Um, you know, so the answer here is they are part of the PNS and they are neuron axons. If we have PNS and they're neuron cell bodies, then we would call them ganglia. If they were in the CNS and they were axons, we would have called them tracts. So the um, formal definition of nerves, and again, things like the sciatic nerve, the ulnar nerve, we'll talk about different nerves, the optic nerve. Um, they are basically bundles of axons carrying messages in the peripheral nervous system. You know, they can be either sensory if they're carrying messages in from the senses, or they can be motor where they're carrying messages out to your muscles. Uh, but they're always in the peripheral nervous system. And so you should remember that definition. Um, what's an, if, if I had an efferent nerve, what would that be controlling? What would that be responsible for? Motor. Motor. Motor, motor efferent. If I had an afferent, that would be sensory. You know, and in general, most nerves are going to be mixed. Um, all of the spinal nerves, the nerves that are coming, originating from your spinal cord, they have both sensory and motor. Um, when you're in the cranial nerves, which we'll talk about a little more there, there's sometimes ones that are pretty much purely motor or purely sensory or sometimes a mix of both. Um, doob -de -doob -de -doob. Choose all the glial cells that produce myelin sheaths. Um, most people got this. Oligodendrocytes if you're in the CNS. Schwann cells if you're in the peripheral nervous system. Um, thank God nobody clicked on rapocytes. Um, microglia are again, their little phagocytes, little things that are part of the immune system helping eat things that shouldn't be there or clean up messes. Tendimal cells are the ones that are lining all the hollow spaces, high, lining the ventricles and canals within the brain um, with little cilia helping circulate the cerebrospinal fluid. Astrocytes are helping provide metabolic support. They're the ones that are kind of transferring um, nutrients and sugars to the neurons. They're the ones that are helping create the blood-brain barrier. They're also helping maintain the extracellular milieu around the, around the neurons. Uh, 
where do we find satellite cells? Everywhere. CNS. Oh, they're the ones that are CNS. microphages. Satellite cells are peripheral nervous system. They're the ones that kind of pack around the neurons, around the ganglia in the peripheral nervous system. Um, Okie dokie. So, any questions about any of that stuff? All right, so what we're going to do now is get a little more into, you know, the parts of the brain that, you know, I, I find more compelling, like the, like, what's it doing? You know, you've got this mass of tissue in your skull. It's like, doesn't weigh much. It's only like, you know, let me, I can stop. Should I stop sharing this thing? Um, your brain is only like about three and a half pounds. Um, it's not. It's not a huge amount of your of you by mass. Although it does take up a huge amount of your metabolic resources. Like the um, neurons in your brain are really um, hungry for both like oxygen and glucose and things like that. Um, I forget how, what is it? At some point, I have somewhere in my notes what percentage of your, of your um, blood flow goes there, but it's a huge amount. Um, it's complicated too. Um, most of your neural tissue is in your brain. I have like here some little, this little factoid. A piece of brain, the size of a grain of sand, so some tiny little piece of brain, has about 100,000 neurons, 2 million axons, and the part that gets really amazing is like the interconnections, like a billion synapses. So you've got this crazy amount of interconnections and these neurons making all these different circuits in your brain. Um, and as we've seen, synapses are kind of slow. A synapse has all these different steps. An action potential gets to the, the terminal, and then calcium comes in, which triggers exocytosis of neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter diffuses across the synapse, and then it binds to a receptor, which often turns on some second messenger pathway, and ultimately we open up some channels and then we've got some voltage change on the target, um, target neuron. You know, all of that takes time. Um, you know, it takes you know milliseconds, thousands, you know, thousands of a second. If you look at a, you know, where is it? An iPhone. I've got like an iPhone here. This thing can do calculations. You know, we talk about like teraflops. We talk about the how many billions of floating point mathematical operations can this do per second. It's crazy how fast a computer can process information. Um, and yet it's only been like literally in the last few years that we have like these robots that can actually you know, in some, you know, with some sense of not falling on its face, kind of just walk across a room. Um, so some of the stuff we take for granted that we're just running around and jumping and climbing and navigating through things, having like designing some robot running by these computers with super fast, you know, integrated circuits and stuff, they can do this kind of stuff that we can do with this really in some ways, really kind of slow, primitive kind of system for um, processing information. So one of the things to think about that's like kind of very different about how your brain is connected compared to how most computers are kind of connected up is there's this we call like massive parallel processing. So there is a lot, like any particular problem that your brain is working on, there it's kind of split up into many, many different processing streams, which are all kind of all happening at once and all kind of 
the answers all kind of converge together. So you end up having the ability to solve these really kind of complicated control problems. You know, some, you know, my original background is electrical engineering. I can say the kind of math and the kind of problem solving involved in just having some robotic arm that can reach out, grab something and pull it back is very non-trivial. And you can kind of see this. We'll talk about like you have some damage to your cerebellum or something that's trying to coordinate your motor movement. You, know, you want to be able to reach out, get your hand where you want it to be quickly, have it get to where it is, stop there, be steady there. It's very non-trivial. If you have cerebellar damage, you'll reach out, you'll overshoot. And then you're like, oh my God, wait, that's not where I want it. Let me pull it back. And then you'll, over, you'll kind of oscillate around where you want to have your limb actually resting. And you know, having the neural circuitry that just lets you put your body where you want it and make it stop and not like kind of vibrate and tremor everywhere is very non-trivial. Um, information processing, you look around the world and you see computers and you see people, you see little, you know, all that's landing on your retina is just light and dark and some colors. And yet you don't see that. You see crazy world full of objects. And, you know, I have a piece of paper here and I have a cell phone. Oh, I got to turn off the virtual thing because that, that's not what I meant to do. I meant to do. Oh, come on, come on, come on. There I am. All right. So here's a piece of paper and here's a cell phone. And right now, nobody there, assuming you're like kind of normal, is thinking like, oh my God, a quarter of the cell phone just disappeared. Now it looks kind of like a Pac-Man, you know? And it's like, oh my God, some witchcraft. How did it come back? It's complete. It's like in your brain, you're just like, okay, it's hidden behind the paper. Okay, it's back. I see it. But that's not what your eye, that's not the information that's coming into your brain. The information coming into your brain is there's half of cell phone, there's a whole cell phone. Um, nobody probably thought like, oh my God, his cell phone's gone. Now there's just this weird little thing that looks like a pencil. Like, oh my God, it just magically became like a big rectangular cell phone again. Now it's back in this pencil. Oh my God, now it's like, half the length that it was. And now it's a pencil that's the full length. Now it's a cell, it's like, you're just seeing me rotate a cell phone. But that's not what's on your retina, right? The thing that's actually on your retina is a thing that looks kind of like a pencil, a thing that looks like a pencil that's half as long. Now it looks like a big flat rectangle again. And, but your brain is doing all sorts of crazy calculations that just turn it into this physical object in three dimensions that's rotating around. Um, you know, I, you know, I can do one of the classic, um, classic examples of this. I'm just taking, I'm taking a piece of paper. I'm going to So I'm, I'm basically drawing, I'm drawing three Pac-Mans on my piece of paper here. And they're all kind of facing each other. So if I show you this, what do a lot of people see? A triangle. It looks like a triangle. 
there is no triangle. It's three Pac-Mans just looking at each other. And yet you create, we call these illusory contours. You kind of just fill in. It's like the thing in the real world that would most likely look like this would be some white triangle blocking three black circles. But there is no circle here and there's no triangle here, right? This is all kind of magic that your brain is making up to make what is the most likely interpretation of the raw data that's coming into your, your, op, your um, visual system, right? There are no circles here. There are no triangles here, yet your brain turns them into circles and triangles and three dimensions of things blocking in front or behind. So there's, there's lots of, you know, as we go on over the next couple of weeks, I will show you kind of more and more examples of, in general, this is useful, right? In general, this is how you actually take in the information around you and interpret it in a way that is going to allow you to navigate and do what you need to do. Um, but you can also, you know, kind of get sneaky and totally fool the nervous system and you can end up having a lot of fun with all sorts of visual illusions and things like that by kind of messing with these basic processes, um, so it's, which is kind of fun. Um, but anyway, just kind of putting that out there, your nervous system is doing so much complicated stuff, um, again, from just control of your body to make it do what you want to do, to doing really complicated image processing, like all this raw data coming in, and yet you're not just seeing splotches of light and color, you're like creating this useful interpretation of what the world is out there that allows you to you know, do what you need to do. And it's happening with these squishy little neurons that are really pokey, really slow in terms of, again, if you're doing like looking at computer chips, computer chips literally are doing billions and billions of mathematical operations per second. And your neurons are taking many thousands of a second just for one to like, hey, good, here's a message, take it on to the next part of the processing stream here. Um, but it's amazing what you can do with that because of this kind of massive parallel kind of organization and all of these, the way, the way it, some of the um, computer systems now that are being used to solve some of the more and more complicated problems are kind of going in that direction. Like even like my lap, my, my computer that I'm running my Zoom meeting off here has like quad cores. You know, it's like there's four things kind of going together, kind of taking the problem apart and converging on a solution faster than kind of my old original like, you know, 10 years ago, it would have just been a single core. People didn't even think about multiple core processors in your computer. And, um, but your brain is doing that on steroids. And that's, you know, again, because it's, it's not intuitive how you can do such complicated processing with such kind of, at some level, crude components. Um, so anyway, so I guess kind of putting that out there, that you know, because people often think of the brain like a computer. And in some level, there is kind of that. There's this level of, you know, there's an input. You've got your sensory information. There's the integration, the processing. There's some response. You know, you move your body, you secrete stuff, you know, versus your computer, like print something out or put something on the screen. Um, but then there's differences. Other differences that we'll talk about, um, you know, when we get, in fact, I'll talk about in more detail in just a few moments as we start talking about different parts of the brain that process sensory information, is it's not this one-way thing. Like in a computer, you've got, in fact, I can just draw. Draw. You know, the classic idea, if you, if you like, um, I can go back. You know, the classic idea is you've got like kind of input 
Now you've got your processing, we call it integration. You've got your output. And in a computer, it's pretty much, you know, this is your keyboard or your, your microphone or whatever. And it's just always sending the information here. And this is where the processing happens. When we get into the human brain, there's gonna be something else going on that is really kind of trippy. And that is what we call kind of this top-down control. Like this would be bottom up. Here's the basic information, you know, coming into the more complicated processing centers. But we're gonna see there's a whole lot of kind of top-down control of the basic systems that are involved for taking information in. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this more explicitly in the visual system, particularly like just depending on how you're looking at the world, how you are using your visual attention, what am I paying attention to or not, actually sends messages down into your um, more initial stages of visual processing and change how much of your visual cortex is actually being allocated to one or another part of the visual field. So how much information you're getting about some part of the visual field actually is influenced by these higher centers about what am I actually trying to pay attention to here? Um, so I'll, I'll, again, I'll talk about that in, in more detail later. So just kind of putting out there, like the brain is doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, and it's similar to a computer in some ways and a superficial analogy, but don't take that too far because it's also got a lot of other, other aspects that make it, make it different. Um, and it's also, it's also doing, yeah, we'll talk about the, when people talk about like Bayesian, um, Bayesian inference, it's, it's constantly taking input in and revising, revising what the model of this, what actually must be out here. So it's constantly in flux. Um, it's constantly readjusting probabilities you know, it's not like there is some model and you're taking in the world and processing it according to that. The more information that comes in, it's constantly readjusting the models, readjusting what it thinks is probably happening out here or what is going to be the best response to something. So it's, it's very kind of fluid that way. Um, you know, it, yeah, it learns, it's, it's constantly kind of learning and adjusting its behavior as opposed to kind of a kind of more kind of just system that is designed. You put this input and the output's the same. It's like the input actually affects the processing. Um, so eventually this, this is being changed by what's coming in. So Let's continue. All right, um, we need a little more um, just an anatomical terminology um, to fully just dive into the brain. We've talked about, you know, the CNS. Okay, we're going to be doing CNS right now. Um, we'll get to the PNS um, in due time, but for right now, we're going to be doing brain and spinal cord. And in fact, for the next Today and next class probably is going to be just the brain. Um, you know, we already talked about the idea like nuclei, you can neuron cell bodies. Um, neuron cell bodies are also located in these layers. So a nuclei would be kind of like a cluster of neuron cell bodies and kind of like a, in, a, um, in a little block. But then you also have the neuron cell bodies in these big layers that just cover the entire surface of the um, cerebral hemispheres. So 
like if I, so here's, here's like, you know, here I'm talking about the brain. You know, I talked about the brain being here inside somebody's head. Um, if I do a coronal section, so now I'm kind of looking at kind of the front of somebody. You know, now the two hemispheres are kind of like coming out like that. I kind of showed, like remember the, the telencephalon, the cerebral hemispheres, you got one coming off on either side and they get kind of really overgrown and come out. So this is kind of the, this coronal section. This is like looking at the brain from the side. This is kind of, if you cut the guy's face off and saw there were two, two hemispheres here. And we had the, you know, the rest of the brain, the brain stem and everything. So these are my cerebral hemispheres. Um, hold on, we need a mute. Um, so the nuclei exist as these kind of deeper so there are these deeper nuclei. There are clusters of cell bodies that we find kind of deeper within the hemispheres. We're going to see the caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus and the amygdaloid nucleus. So there are going to be some of the nuclei, the cell bodies that are located kind of buried more in the hemispheres. But most of the gray matter and most of the stuff that is going to be doing all the interesting sensory processing and motor processing is right on the surface of the, um, of the brain. And we call that the cerebral cortex. And we call that gray matter. So this thing that I'm drawing, this is supposed to be, this is like about five to seven cells thick. These neuron cell bodies. This is where a lot of the really interesting, this is where your personality is kind of being processed. This is where all of your main um, sensory information is being processed. This is where your main motor control is being processed. Um, so this is my cerebral cortex. Cortex means bark, right? It looks, it's kind of bark. It's like the outer coating here. Um, there's a lot of folds, right? Now you've, so, you've seen the brain. The brain is super folded up. Those folds, those we call the sulci. The sulcus is the groove, the gyrus was a ridge. This gives you a huge surface area. Like this cortex, act, people talk about if you flattened out, if you kind of ironed the brain out, so all of the um, folds were flattened out, you'd have, be more like the size of a tablecloth, right? It, but it's all kind of wrinkled up and shoved in your skull. So you can have quite a bit of surface area of cortex to do a lot of processing, but still shove it into your skull. Um, collectively, the cerebral cortex and the deeper nuclei, we call this gray matter. So gray matter are the cell bodies um, that are part of this. And again, some of the gray matter is in these deeper nuclei. A lot of it is in this outer layer, the cerebral cortex. Gray matter can also refer to unmyelinated axons. Um, if we were in anatomy, I would write that out and be more specific. Like there's a little gray commature in the spinal cord and things like that. Don't worry about that. For, you know, for this class, you, know, you can make a more superficial um, assumption. Gray matter in general is the 
the um, cell bodies. That, and that's where kind of the main processing is happening. That's where this kind of integration, this is where all the synapses are coming in. And then we're seeing whether or not the axon hillock hits the threshold. And then, you know, so this is, this is like the processing, processing bank. Um, obviously, we have to interconnect all of these neurons. They have all their axons, which go and talk to the other ones. You know, those are what we call those tracts. So let's talk about that. And that we're gonna call white matter. White matter is just going to be myelinated axons. So, you know, myelin, which is this kind of fatty stuff, is white looking. Um, that's why it gets the name white matter. If you take a slice through a brain, the places that are mainly axons interconnecting things look whitish, look lighter than the, the gray matter, the cell bodies. Um, you know, we talked about tracts, fiber tracts. That's what we called groups of myelinated axons in the CNS. Um, there are three main um, varieties of these fiber tracts that you need, to, you should be aware of. Um, association fibers. These are things that interconnect things within a single hemisphere. Um, I'm going to draw this kind of blue, even though it's white matter, I need a color. So I have all these cell bodies and I need to have things that interconnect things within a hemisphere. So this would be kind of white matter that's interconnecting things, you know, just between different neurons within the same hemisphere. Those would be association fibers. I can use different colors. I'll use two. Commissural fibers. Or what we call commissures. These are things that interconnect between the right and left sides. Um, there are a variety, there's a few different commissures. Um, for this class, the main commissure you should know is the corpus callosum, which is the main group of axons that interconnects the right and left hemispheres of the brain. And I'll say there are others. Um, towards the front, um, an important landmark is like the anterior commissure. Um, so there's more than just the corpus callosum, but it is the main band of, of axons that connects the right and left hemispheres. And it goes all the way from the front down to the back all along. Um, yeah, we're, so that's that. And then finally, we have projection fibers. Projection fibers are the ones that connect higher and lower areas of the um, nervous system. So they're kind of coming up from below and carrying messages up into the hemispheres and carrying messages out of the hemispheres down into the spinal cord into the rest of the body. So projection fibers are connecting kind of higher and lower. So those are the three main kind of flavor, um, varieties of axonal, axonal tracts that you find. You have association fibers interconnecting within a single hemisphere, commissural fibers interconnecting right and left, left to right, projection fibers um, if you remember from anatomy, the main one here is the internal capsule and the corona radiata. 
the internal capsule is kind of the main band riding up and down. As it goes up into the hemispheres, it starts branching out and different fibers go to different areas. That's what they call the corona radiata, the radiating crown, is all the axons start spreading out um, into the variety of different places in the hemisphere. Um, so this is kind of more of the more of the more of the definitions you need to know. You need to, and you need to know sulcus and gyrus because you often we're going to call things you know the post central gyrus or this or that. Um, sulcus tends to be shallow if you have a deeper thing like you know like the groove in between the two hemispheres that's usually more called like a fissure. Um, but there, depending if you look in some old books, sometimes fissures and sulcuses are used interchangeably. So don't get too caught up on what exactly is a fissure or a sulcus. Um, and again, as we go through, we're going to, I'm going to start introducing the brain and we're going to talk mostly about the cerebral cortex. We're going to talk about all this kind of processing that happens on the surface of the brain. We don't even have to cut things open to actually see what's going on. Um, but then we're going to also talk about the deeper nuclei. We'll talk about the, um, we call the basal nuclei and stuff like that as well as we continue on talking about the brain. But the stuff I'm going to be talking about for the rest of today um, is all going to be the cerebral cortex. It's going to be processing that's happening literally on the surface of the brain. Um, one of the things that's kind of cool is because it's right on the surface of the brain, it's really easy to access. Um, a lot of the information we have about what's going on here happened because like in the 50s, this guy Penfield had, you know, patients who had their skull off you know, for brain surgery and agreed to be experimental subjects. And they would use little electrical stimulations on different parts of the cortex. You know, so you can, you can access this. As long as your skull is off, you can like, actually touch the cerebral cortex. It's the surface of the brain. And they would put a little electrical signal, kind of the same way we were doing with the nerve stimulation lab. You put a little electrical current across and you felt a little twitch on your fingers, they could do that on the brain. And it's like, oh, I feel something on this part of my body or this part of my body. It's like, oh, that part of the brain is responsible for sensation on this part of the body. Or maybe they would put a little electrical stimulation and their finger would twitch. It's like, oh, that part of the cortex is responsible for motor control of the finger. Or they put a little electrical stimulation and you hear weird sounds. It's like, oh my God, we're dealing with auditory processing now. Um, there are literally parts of the temporal lobes where you stimulate and people get these weird sensations, what we call like felt presence. They think is, you know, you know, people have kind of tied into like the sensation of religious experience and stuff of like, whoa, I feel like there's something else out there beyond me. You can, you can actually create those kind of experiences depending on where you're stimulating the, the cerebral cortex. So it's, it's kind of trippy. Um, all right. So any questions about kind of basic layout? You know, because I'm going to be kind of freely saying, like, we're talking about cerebral cortex here. I want to make sure you realize we're talking about the neurons located on the surface of the brain. I have a quick question. Um, so gray matter includes the cerebral cortex and the deeper nuclei. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So the gray matter is located both on the surface and in these deeper pockets. And again, if you wanted to get really pedantic in a more anatomical sense, um, there are some examples of unmyelinated axons that get lumped into the term gray matter because it's ultimately stuff that's not coated with myelin. But 
that's not so, it's not so relevant. We'll talk about, again, the basal nuclei, you know, other things like the hippocampus is going to be a really fascinating pocket of gray matter that's kind of down in the floors of the temporal lobes and stuff. Um, okay. Uh, one more question. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, sulcus, sulcus is the uh, kind of a, like a deeper um, groove and versus the fissure is a little um, shallow no. groove? No, or opposite? the opposite. Okay. The fissure is typically kind of a deep groove. A sulcus is more of a shallow groove. Okay. Thank you. All right. So the brain. So this might make sense. I'm gonna I'm going to show a, I'm going to share my screen here. Actually, I'm not sure I have this up yet. If I, I'm going to double check. If I don't have these, these are the, um, I'll make sure I have all of the Silverthorn um, um, PowerPoint things up uploaded for you so you have access to any of the things that you see me use during lecture. Um, this is kind of showing our brain is way more complicated than a lot of other creatures. Like an earthworm has a very primitive brain. You know, you go into it, bird, you know, actually there was a thing actually this week in Science Magazine they're actually showing how bird brains, even though they have kind of a different layout than ours, like especially like kind of the corvids, like the crows and like jays and stuff, they do pretty freaking complicated problem solving. And they've actually kind of, I've kind of watched, kind of analyzed more what kind of circuitry they use. And even if, if some, some of these non-human brains are actually pretty darn amazing, um, they're just laid out a little different and do different things. Some of the bird brains are also fascinating in that they um, grow and subtract parts depending on the season and what you need the processing power for. Like some of these songbirds will actually have major parts of the brain that grow and develop for really complicated song singing and you know, so, you know, auditory, auditory processing. And then at the end of the mating season, those will get those will kind of break down and the brain will be optimized for other things. You know, I think because if you're a bird, you worry about weight, you know, so we can have the luxury of let's just put all the parts there and carry them around on the top of our neck here. But if you're a bird and you need to fly, uh, you know, they have different parts of the brain that actually grow or subtract depending on the season, particularly these songbirds and stuff. Um, this brain here, you can see all this stuff, this forebrain that, this is just the forebrain. This is the cerebral hemisphere that has just kind of come out and overgrown over all the rest. This is sitting on top of the diencephalon and the midbrain and the pons and the medulla. You know, all of that stuff is kind of located, enveloped. So what we're going to be talking about for the rest of today, and again, a lot of the next class, is just processing happening just in these cerebral hemispheres. Um, and again, even not just in the hemisphere, but on the surface. All this stuff, I'm putting dots on the surface, that's all the cortex. Um, this is, we talked about this. Again, we started with this little forebrain but then that cerebrum just grew and grew and grew and just ended up folding out over everything else. And this, this should be familiar from the stuff we talked about last class. Um, the different parts of the brain are gonna be named based by the um, bones that they're kind of sitting underneath. If you remember anatomy, you had the frontal bone here, 
the parietal bones, the occipital bone, the temporal bone. So we have, you know, the frontal lobe. We have the parietal lobe. We're going to have the occipital lobe. We're going to have the temporal lobe. You know, those are different areas of the, of the cerebrum. And we'll be looking at each of those and seeing kind of what's happening there. Um, make sure, you know, cerebrum. I'm going to say this just because people get confused. Cerebrum, not cerebellum. Cerebellum is the thing on the back of the brainstem, which looks kind of similar into spelling, except it's got a couple of L's. Um, so don't get those confused. Cerebrum, and again, we also call it the cerebral hemispheres because there are two, two like kind of half, you know, two, two halves to it, which are both kind of like half of half of a sphere. Um, so cerebral hemispheres. Again, here's you know the right and the left cerebral hemispheres. Here's that kind of longitudinal fissure going down in between the two. Oh, this you all re recognize. Again, this is kind of, now that we've got more vocabulary, here is the brain tissue. Here is white matter. This is gonna be all these fibers interconnecting. This is the gray matter. This is the cerebral cortex, this outermost layer where all this processing is going on. And then we've got like the pia mater, the arachnoid layer, the arachnoid villi going into the dural sinuses which then is gonna, you know, and we're, we're gonna talk more about CSF and stuff a little later. Um, but just gonna, this should look familiar to y'all. Oh, this is a good picture. Just again, for this class, you don't need to know the details. If in anatomy, you had to memorize all the different dural, all the different um, ventricles, but just to kind of remember, all this blue stuff here, this is representing the hollow spaces inside the brain, the ventricles, the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, the fourth ventricle, the central canal of the spinal cord. Again, what, what kind of cells are lining all those hollow spaces? Ependymons, ependymal cells. It's all lined by ependymal cells. What kind of, what's, what's, what's filling that space inside of all those hollow spaces? CSF. All filled with CSF. And ultimately the CSF comes out into that subarachnoid space and then can float around the outside of the brain as well. And it's being produced by the little choroid plexuses located kind of on the floors of the lateral ventricle, on the roof of the third ventricle, down here in the fourth ventricle. Um, so I think it's useful having prettier pictures to kind of just reemphasize the stuff we've already talked about. So that's, that's this. Um, again, remember the blood brain barrier? We talked about how the astrocytes help create this. You know, this is, this is important. The Capillaries in general are pretty permeable. Their whole purpose in general is to allow material to enter and leave the blood. The whole reason of having a bloodstream is to deliver stuff and pick stuff up. But when you're in the central nervous system, you have to be way more careful about what gets loose amongst the neurons because different molecules might act as a ligand at a receptor and start causing, causing issues. So the capillaries that are in the brain, in the spinal cord, have this much more elaborate control over what can enter and leave the, the um, bloodstream and get into the space around the neurons. My like, question. Yes? Uh, so the astrocytes are more, more mainly concentrated in the uh, CNS, or they're found uh, both in CNS and PNS? They're purely, the only, the only glial cells that you find in the PNS are the satellite cells. Satellite cells. So astrocytes are purely in the CNS. 
And do astrocytes cover the capillary? Yeah, they kind of reach out. You can kind of see what they're doing here. They have these little processes that reach down and along with the wall of the capillary help create this kind of boundary between the bloodstream and the tissue space. Um, and they're also transporting the um, nutrients. We're, we'll talk, you know, astrocytes like are about transporting kind of sugars into, you know, from the bloodstream to the neurons. So they're necessary for this kind of metabolic support of the neurons. Um, so yeah, I mentioned that um, therapeutics, if you're, you know, it gets really tricky sometimes. Like one of like, one of the things, like one of the stories you might, you probably have heard of is for people with Parkinson's disease where you are having less and less dopamine in parts of your brain and you can actually help at least initially some of the symptoms by increasing the amount of dopamine in the brain but you can't just take dopamine um, and it won't get into the brain because dopamine doesn't cross the blood brain barrier so people were trying to figure out how can we increase the dopamine in the brain if dopamine can't get across the blood brain barrier and they found by giving people a precursor like L-dopa that that L-dopa actually did cross the blood brain barrier. And once it was in the tissue space around the neurons was converted to dopamine and increased dopamine levels and helped with the symptoms. Um, we will, can talk more about ultimately symptoms can keep, keep getting worse. It's like temporary. It's not like it lasts forever, but you know, there's things like that. People have to get clever when they're trying to come up with therapeutics that are going to be helping with the central nervous system because getting a drug that actually makes it into the space around the neurons is non-trivial because most things are blocked from getting out across the blood-brain barrier. Uh, oh, here, this, again, your brain is three and a half pounds of your body and yet is getting 15% of the blood pumped by your heart. That gives you a sense of its metabolic needs. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, when we get into the cardiovascular system later, we'll talk about all sorts of control of your, of your um, circulation. And you know, you need to, you're constantly increasing or decreasing blood flow to here or there, depending on the tissue's metabolic needs or your, trying to keep your blood pressure from dropping or this or that. Um, kind of the two places that always get what they need are the brain and the heart. You know, obviously the heart, you don't wanna skimp on the heart's like supply of oxygen and nutrients because if the heart's not working, every, it's like kinda, the mask comes down, put the mask on yourself before you try to save your kids because if you're dead, you're not gonna save your kid anyway. Um, so the heart has to be going or else nothing else is getting blood, but the brain as well. The brain is really intolerant of ischemia. So ischemia is like lack of blood flow. You know, most, if you've probably fallen asleep on your arm and cut off the blood flow and it's like really freaking weird. It's like, wait, it, it doesn't work. You know, and then it's like, oh my God, it's coming back and it's pins and needles and it's like, ah, stop that. You know, but it's like, assuming that you didn't, you, you weren't sleeping on your arm for too long, you don't have to amputate. You know, the, the cells didn't die. The cells just kind of like went to sleep. Um, there is, there is a case, there's something called, set, what do they call it? Saturday, Saturday night palsy, where people are so drunk that they fall asleep on their arm and they're so drunk and their CNS is so depressed that the normal triggers, the warnings that will come in and wake you up and it's like, oh, I gotta get circulation. If that doesn't work, people do get permanent like nerve damage and stuff. But in general, if you block off blood flow to your arm for a while, your arm's gonna come back. Um, the neurons in your brain are different. If you block off blood supply to the neurons in your brain, even for more than a few minutes, 
they start going into this program cell death, this kind of apoptosis. You know, I think trying to avoid even a worse problem of cells falling apart and spewing toxic stuff and just taking everything out. But your, your neurons are really not very good at dealing with lack of oxygen. So um, you don't want to, yeah. So I mean, so that's, I mean, if you've ever thought about it, it's a kind of pretty different. Like if you fall, you know, put a tourniquet on your arm for 10 minutes, you're not going to lose your arm. But if you put a tourniquet around your neck for, you know, 10 minutes, you're going to be dead. It's kind of a different, a whole different kind of metabolic um, process going on. Um, what else about the brain? Um, okay, the lobes. So what we're going to be talking about now are these different lobes. Again, kind of putting this the front, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe. Um, you know, in anatomy, you have to worry more about kind of super details. For this class, you don't need super details, but you do need to know the main lobes. Um, this, most of the drawings I'm going to be doing for the first part of this discussion are going to be of just the brain not even cut open at all. Again, if you just take the skull off and see the brain sitting there, you're looking at the cortex, which is the part that we are interested in right now. Um, if you crack the two halves of the walnut, this view here, this is kind of looking in between the two halves. Like we're kind of looking down in between the two hemispheres. Let me see. Boom, boom, come on. There, right there. So, so a lot of what we're doing is just looking at the side, from the side. But then we also are going to look at, if we crack the walnut in half, there's some interesting stuff on the inside. Again, it's not, you don't have to cut the brain open, but you still need to kind of drop down into that fissure to see stuff. Um, there is also another fissure that has interesting stuff that you have to kind of dive down into. This lateral, they're calling this lateral sulcus. Other books call it the lateral fissure because it's actually very deep. Um, if you pull that apart, you actually get another another kind of lobe called the insula that we're going to talk about, which is actually important. You know, this mid-sagittal, this is showing, you know, this cingulate gyrus is actually going to be important. Um, we're talking about functionality. The cingulate gyrus, you actually have to kind of go down into that fissure between the two hemispheres to see. Um, well, this is kind of showing the gray matter Gray matter is either on the surface as the cortex, or it's these deeper pockets as the deeper nuclei. And again, we'll be talking about both of those as we go on. Are the lobes just part of the uh, cortex? Um, no, the lobe is just like the whole chunk of this uh, hemisphere. So like when we look at the, um, temporal lobe. This is like the temporal lobe here. It includes, um, we're going to see that it's going to, it's actually not in here. It's going to include like, you know, the hippocampus is down in here, stuff like that. Um, so this is, this is, I'm kind of showing you the insula. The insula, if you are looking at this temporal lobe and looking at this lateral fissure here, and you are really little and you put on your kind of brain mountain climbing gear and you lowered yourself down into this crevasse here at the um, temporal lobe junction, you would kind of go down, down, and then you'd land on some more cortex that's hidden. This 
hidden cortex down in here is the insula, which is going to be important. I mean, it's like a little island. Insula is going to be part of where you're like kind of processing kind of your proprioception, just your sense of your, your being in your body, um, as well as other things. Um, the cingulate gyrus is this ridge, which is just sitting here. Again, this is that division between the right and left hemispheres. If you kind of go down, here's the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum are just the axons interconnecting the two sides, but there's some gray matter right above the corpus callosum that is important. It's going to be important when we get to the limbic system, kind of processing emotions, um, like especially like right here, this the anterior cingulate gyrus here, the kind of part that's more towards the front is important for when we talk about emotional processing later, or like we're gonna talk about different things, the way your brain has to try to figure out kind of the pragmatic versus the emotional aspects of some decision-making process and weighing like what makes the most sense rationally and what feels the right thing to do. You know, we're gonna start calling in like, you know, the, sen this, the anterior cingulate gyrus. So you kind of wanna have an idea of where is the cingulate? The cingulate is just this gray matter here, kind of sitting in that groove between the hemispheres right above the corpus callosum. Um, uh, we'll talk about the limbic system. I, I just mentioned the limbic system and cingulate gyrus plays a role. Um, we'll also see lots of other places, the hippocampus, which is gray matter down in the um, deeper gray matter in the temporal lobes, amygdala is more deeper gray matter. Um, well, so we'll talk more about this later. Oh, this is also just showing the, um, the insula again. The insula, to see the insula, you got to kind of go down into this temporal, you know, behind the temporal lobe here into this little groove. Um, this is going to, there's going to be important stuff down in here. So this is what we're going to do now. We're going to look at the brain and we are going to look at these different areas like the prefrontal area, the motor cortex of the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, the temporal lobe. And we're going to be talking about what are some of the main functionality that we find there. Um, and kind of before we do that, let's talk about how do we know? How do we know all the stuff that is going on in the brain? I'm going to start talking about I'm going to start talking about where it, you know, this part is where your personality is. And this part is doing, you know, visual processing or auditory processing or this or that processing. Um, how do we figure this kind of stuff out? How do we get all this information that I'm going to be speaking so definitively about? Why should you trust, trust me or trust your book? Where do we, where, how do we figure this all out? Doing research. It, it is research, but how much tools do we use? By looking at the homunculi. Uh, uh, research on rats or, or animals that have a similar behavior than us. Um, and what, what would you do with them to like, but how, what actual mm. tools, what, what physical things would you do? Let's, Let's say you had a human or a rat and you're trying to like figure out what's the function of this part of the brain or that part of the brain. You can look at people that have strokes or tumors and see where those things are and see how it affects them. So that was, that's a big part of some of the original understanding of the brain came from what we call lesion studies. You know, maybe I should write these words. Um, 
a lesion is tissue damage. Um, we're going to be talking about these parts of the brain that are critical for language processing, like Broca's area, Wernicke's area. Um, the way people first, Paul Broca back in like the 1800s, the way he realized that this particular part of the brain was essential for language production was he was a neurologist who had a patient who lost the ability to form words. You know, what they call patient time, because all he could do was say time, 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 time. And whenever he tried to talk, all he could do was like time, time. And when the dude finally died, they autopsied him and they looked at his brain and found there was very specific damage to this very specific part in the kind of frontal areas um, on the left side of his brain. And they were able to like, okay, this very specific part of the brain is gone. And he had this very specific symptom of inabil inability to form language. Um, so bingo, I bet you this part of the brain is important for language production. So there's a lot of that going on. A lot of what we know is from lesion studies. Um, even it happens today, but people look at, I mean, I, it was a little creepy. I remember once going to a talk where people had certain theories about how different parts of the brain were processing information and somebody came in with some wed wound, head wound that got, you know, shot in the head in some violent altercation and the bullet specifically just obliterated a really part of, part of the brain that they were particularly interested in. And there's actually a lot of people who make their living as kind of subjects who have very specific brain lesions and go around and, you know, allow themselves to be test subjects where you can see what, what's still working, what isn't working, what looks almost normal, but when you look deeper is actually not the way it would normally function. So, and actually, the, if most of you have been in psychology or something. There's like Phineas Gage, who like had the you know metal rod go through his you know prefrontal areas, you know, and it didn't kill him. So obviously, nothing in there was important for you know basic kind of you know functioning to keep your body going. But it you know really changed his personality. So there's you know. Again, I've, we had in my class, we met a, somebody with um, prefrontal damage who, you know, he could walk and talk and he was kind of fascinating, but then the more you talk to them, he had like no impulse control. He just sees a woman he finds attractive and reaches out and tries to touch her breasts or something. You know, it's like, okay, there's something really wrong here, even though on the surface, he looks, he first walks into the room, he looks like a pert normal, he's functioning normally. So there's a lot of people who have particular brain damage that end up becoming, you know, sometimes they end up flying around all over the country to be subjects in studies. Um, lesion studies, another way that people now can use, um, there's something called TMS, transcranial um, magnetic stimulation. what they do here is, you know, normally like here's your, brain sitting in your skull. You know, normally if you want to get at the brain or electrically stimulate the brain, you need to cut the skull off. And there is a lot of that. Um, in fact, let, let me talk about another, before I get into this a little more deeply, Another way we've learned a lot is by people who have had their skull cut off or their, their, their um, cranial, their skull cap removed to do brain surgery for either because of like epilepsy or tumors or something, they have to go in. And then once the brain is exposed, there's no pain receptors in the, um, in the brain. So you can touch the brain, stick needles in it or whatever, and there is no pain. 
So people often will allow themselves to be subjects. And a lot of the stuff that we learned originally, like in the 50s, were these subjects where, again, I was talking about electrically stimulate parts of the cortex and see what happens. Is this making the body twitch part of muscular control? Am I feeling something weird on my body as part of sensory processing? Um, there's at UCS, like, there's one of the, one of the labs at, um, at Berkeley, they actually do these whole arrays of um, electrodes they put over people's brains when their skulls are off. Um, and then they can, they can see all sorts of processing going on, measure all sorts of things, what's going on in the cortex. So there is a lot of that going on. Transcranial magnetic stimulation lets you take somebody where you don't cut their skull off, but you can still mess with the electrical signals in their brain. You can take a, this big magnetic coil um, and create a very focused magnetic field. Um, if you've been in physics, um, you know, all elect, you know, if you have changing magnetic fields, that's going to induce electrical currents. You know, that's, you know, electricity and magnetism are just kind of two sides of the same coin. So if you have a magnetic field that you're creating and collapsing, it's going to create electrical currents in the brain right underneath there. So you can actually stimulate this person's brain just through this big magnetic coil, through this machine, this transcranial magnetic stimulation um, device. Um, they use it to both kind of twitch people, but then they can also create what they call virtual lesions. If you do kind of, kind of strong, rapid um, stimulation there, that part of the cortex will stop responding for the next 15 minutes or something. And then it supposedly comes back to normal functioning. Um, and th these are people do, normal people do volunteer for these. I've never volunteered for these because especially these virtual lesion ones sound kind of edgy. You know, you're assuming everything's back to normal afterwards, but I don't know. Um, but so this is another way. Another, what's another way we figure out what's going on in the brain? Gets a lot of press. It's the stuff I've been doing at Berkeley. Drugs. Um, so there are pharma, 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 pharmacological interventions you can do to, but more direct what part of the brain is doing what. So fMRI, this is functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, MRI, this is, most people have heard of MRIs. You know, it's just ways to get images of, it could be of your brain or it could be of your knee or your back or something. If you've you know, just got a herniated disc, you probably go in for an MRI because it can give you information that an x-ray doesn't give you. It has different ways of processing different tissues. Um, you know, when I was in college, this was like called like, what did they call it? Nuclear magnetic resonance. But then they, it sounded creepy to people. So then they changed the name to MRI, just like my magnetic resonance imaging. Um, it, it used to be NMR when I was, when I was in college, now it's MRI. Um, but it's basically this weird, this way where they, we're not going to get into the details. It's basically using this huge freaking magnetic field and getting like your atoms to kind of move, kind of line up in this magnetic field and then use pulses to get them off balance and have them kind of snap back into alignment in the magnetic field and giving off radio waves that you can measure as this happens. And it's going to be different, different signals depending on what kind of tissues you're looking at and stuff. So you can use this just for pure imaging, but functional 
magnetic resonance imaging takes advantage of the fact that the signal that you get from hemoglobin, which we've, well, we, you know hemoglobin, hemoglobin which carries oxygen. If I have oxygenated hemoglobin versus deoxygenated, they have a different signal that you can measure. So the, what, what, deoxygen, what hemoglobin looks like when it has oxygen on it has a different signal than if it doesn't have oxygen, which means you can see what parts of the brain are getting more or less oxygenated blood in the moment. And the control of blood flow to the brain is tightly regulated, so the regions that are getting having a lot of metabolic activity are going to ultimately going to have a lot more blood flow, oxygenated blood flow coming into that region um, after the area has just used up a bunch of oxygen. So you can actually get in real time what parts of the brain tend to be more metabolically active or not. You know, as you have a person who is awake and doing some task, like look at you know, in the studies that I'm doing, I have people looking at different kinds of images and, you know, seeing like how different parts of their brain around anxiety are, are responding, you know, before and after they've done these therapies that are designed to hopefully help them like have better emotional regulation. Um, so you can actually see what's going on in their brain. Um, you have pretty bad resolution in terms of both time and space. Um, the signals are really slow. Um, you can see things that are happening over seconds, but not much faster. And you can only see large ensembles of neurons. You can see like neurons, like, you know, th thousands and thousands of neurons working together but the volume that you're looking at is like, what is going on in like this little three by three millimeter cube of the brain. It's not like looking at specific neurons. For that, you need to use like an electrode in a neuron and that tends to be more something you would do on a non-human subject. You know, they do that in a lot of non-human mammals. They'll use single, electro, you know, single unit recording, stick an electrode in a neuron but that's in general, that's not something you would do on a, on a human. Um, but it's kind of wild. This is something that's only happened in the, last, in the last tens of years where we've got these better tools and we get better and better tools. Other ones that we're gonna talk about um, a little, probably next class, EEG. If you just put electrodes and just record, what are the voltages on the scalp? You know, as the brain is doing all its electrical activity, there is going to be voltage changes, very small, you know, down in the millionths of a volt, but measurable, that you can actually measure on the scalp. And that gives you information about what the brain is doing. But again, very, um, very rough, because it's the sum total of all this activity here on the surface that's creating some signal that you can measure. But clinically, it's really useful. Like for sleep studies, you use EEGs all the time. You, there are typical patterns that you measure as an EEG that are typical and normal, and other ones that are indicative that there's something wrong. Um, so EEGs are really helpful diagnostically um, to look if the brain is functioning properly. Um, again, we'll look at EEGs in more detail. EEGs, EEGs also do have the benefit of very good time resolution. Like you can measure things happening, um, you know, from millisecond to millisecond as signals change. Whereas like, you know, fMRI, like I said, you can look at changes that are happening that are different from over a few seconds. You know, typically, Typically, um, you know, fMRI is not going to be useful for looking at really fine time. Um, so just kind of 
giving you some, I'm going into this, just trying to make this more real rather than just like, oh, here is all the different parts of the brain and what they do. You know, people had to figure it out and people are still figuring it out. You know, some of the stuff I'm gonna tell you is pretty well characterized and other stuff, you know, when we get to the limbic system, emotions, you know, we can tell you about what different regions seem to be really important for emotional processing, but we still have no idea what does it actually mean on kind of a neural level? What are the neural correlates of being happy or being sad or being um, jealous or being excited? Like, you know, we don't know. Um, so it's, you know, there's one part of the brain that we're gonna talk about that is does seem to be specifically connected to anxiety and fear, get to the amygdala. But beyond that, ooh, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you'd imagine that we know that we don't. But that being said, there's a lot of stuff that we do know. Um, where is, let me, before I'll, I take, we stop for our break, I'll mention one last thing. You know, there, are a lot of parts of the brain that do seem to have very specific functions. Um, and if you have damage, lesion to that area, you will have specific deficits, right? So if you get damage to the part of the brain involved with speech production, you lose the ability to do speech. If you lose, if you have damage to part of the brain that controls motor for your arm, you're gonna have paralysis. You're not gonna be able to move that arm. So, you know, that being said, there's also a lot of plasticity um, where different parts of the brain can um, change what they're doing. Um, we'll just introduce this word. We'll talk more about it later. You know, after somebody has a stroke and loses function, often over the coming months, they start regaining function because parts of the brain start rewiring. Um, in the old days, they used to say that, you know, you have all the neurons. Let me just turn off. Um, they used to think that you did not get extra neurons. Um, as you got older, but now they've found that there are stem cells in the brain and there are neurons that will, f you know, kind of divide near the hippocampus and go and migrate and help kind of fix circuits in other parts of the brain. So there is, it's not great. Um, if you have major damage to parts of your brain, it's, it's a good chance you'll never, things aren't going to ever be the same, but there is more of an ability for kind of kind of repair and shifting things around than we used to think. Um, um, what else do I want to say? Maybe that's it. Let's, um, let's take a break. It's nine. We're going to continue talking about the brain and looking at the different things going on across, across the um, cortex. We're just kind of giving you some context on where we are. This is the front. Um, there are a few different um, locations that we need to specifically name. There is a sulcus that is going to separate the frontal and parietal lobes. It has a name, the central sulcus, so you need to know that particular little location. 
what's going on here? There it is. Um, why is uh, my oh? Okay, hold on a second. There it goes. No, it's no oh man. Okay, that ended up way too small. Um, let's just write it out. Come on. Sorry about this. My batteries for my little keyboard died. Central sulcus. That's the vertical sulcus? Uh, yeah, okay. So it's not the longitudinal fissure. It's not the separation between the two hemispheres. It's the thing in one or the other hemisphere that is going to separate the frontal from the parietal lobe. And I should mention that it's, you know, if you've taken anatomy, you'll know that it's not quite as easy to see as I'm drawing it here, but it doesn't matter for our class. Um, other things that you need to know, right in front is going to be a gyrus that's going to be the pre-central gyrus. And right behind it is going to be the post-central gyrus. And those are going to be important. So let's give those names. Um, and let me also, again, all of this, this is kind of the frontal lobe. I'm going to use a different color here. This is my temporal lobe. This in here is the parietal lobe. And on the back is the occipital lobe. And yeah, for the next 25 minutes, we are just going to be looking at these different parts of the brain and we're gonna be limiting ourselves to the cortex to things that are happening on the surface, those layer of, again, like about seven neurons thick on the surface of the brain. Um, so let's, let's start with, let's start with occipital lobe. The vis it's primarily that's where your vision is processed. We're gonna start there. So at the very back of the occipital lobe, I like kind of can think about it being kind of the size and thickness of like a credit card or something, right? Because it's, it's really thin. It's just like a few neurons thick and it's right on the back of your brain. This is where we're gonna find our primary visual cortex. Um, this is going to be a theme we're going to see as we go through all the different senses. The primary cortex is where the kind of raw data is initially processed. Um, when you have visual information coming in, I mean, we're going to follow this in more detail, but it's basically going to come up your optic nerve. Um, you know, all the senses are going to, except for one, go through the thalamus. But then this is the first place 
in the cerebrum where the visual information is, is being processed. Um, and this is, you know, this is mostly kind of the raw data. There's some basic um, looking at kind of orientations of things, um, but there's not a whole lot in terms of like, what exactly are you looking at? Um, and then you get into these higher rate regions, what we start calling the visual association areas. So we're going to see this as a common theme, this idea of association areas. This is kind of where you interpret what the raw data is. Remember I was showing you the, you know, illusory contours of those triangle that isn't really there, you know, that kind of stuff or, you know, things that are blocking or not blocking or the fact that, you know, my iPhone wasn't actually magically disappearing and reappearing or changing shape. It was just, you know, I have a plate. It's round. No, it's a line. Oh my God, it's round again. No, it's an oval. No, it's round again. No, it's a line. No, it's oval. You know, it's like, no, it's a, a plate. I'm rotating a plate, right? That is not raw data. That is something that you have to do more elaborate processing to actually understand that there was some object that was just being rotated and looked at from different angles. But in your mind, it's like, it's just a plate and he's rotating the plate. Um, so that's the you know, visual association. That's one of, you know, when you think about these association areas, it's kind of interpreting um, what is this, what does this data actually mean? How do I use it? Um, that being said, you know, usually like, and this is, I was mentioning the difference between kind of computers and the human brain. You know, there is a lot of information that flows, what we call like bottom up, kind of the raw data going into the higher data, higher areas. And ultimately we're gonna talk about prefrontal area where you have your decision making and things like that. So there is information flowing in what we call bottom up. You know, so there is a flow of information from kind of the more basic information to the places where it's being processed at more um, complicated ways. But one of the things that's kind of non-intuitive is you actually have more um, neurons that go the other way. We call it top down. There's actually a whole bunch of kind of top down connections as well where you have, you have the um, part of the brain that is doing more decision-making. Again, the prefrontal area we're gonna talk about, that's kind of your executive functioning. And it sends messages that actually can alter the functioning of kind of the primary visual cortex. Um, so let me try to explain this more. Um, you know, for most of your senses, there's this idea of mapping of the kind of correspondence between kind of the actual world and the parts of the cortex that are actually processing the information. Um, so if, you know, I'm looking at my screen right now and I see Steven is off on this side of my screen and Maria Lucia is off on that side of the screen. So their images are coming into my eye pretty separated. And if you actually looked at the neurons in my primary visual cortex, the neurons that are processing those images are gonna be spatially separated more. Whereas if I look at Steven and Jamba on my screen, they're right next to each other. And the neurons in my visual cortex processing them are gonna be closer together. So there's this actual kind of correspondence like in the visual cortex, there's a correspondence between my visual field and how things are being processed in the brain there. Like one of the early studies, I mean, it's a little sad, but I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, they did it in cats. You know, so this was like cats. 
and I'm looking, and you had the cats look at just a grid. So the cat is looking at a grid. It doesn't look like it looks like, pretend it's a cat. Um, and then they gave the cats radioactive glucose. So, you know, I talked about neurons using glucose and also how the neurons are really metabolically hungry little buggers. So the neurons that are being particularly active are gonna be taking up more glucose. So they have the cat looking at the grid. They give the, they inject the cat with radioactive glucose. So the neurons in the visual cortex that are being more active in the moment are gonna take up more radioactive glucose. Then they sacrifice the cat. And then they take his or her visual cortex and they flatten it out on a piece of photographic film. And the neuron, you know, radioactivity exposes film. So the neurons that have more radioactive glucose are gonna expose the film more than the neurons that don't have as much. And you actually found out that the neurons in the visual cortex were kind of laid out in this kind of similar pattern to what the cat was actually seeing. So that's this idea of when I'm talking about, you know, the word mapping can mean different things. Um, but in this case, there's this kind of correspondence between where on the cortex are things being processed compared to where are they in the visual field. And we're going to see mapping when we get to the auditory system. You know, sounds that are close in pitch will be processed close together and sounds that are farther apart, like beep, 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 are close in my auditory cortex and beep, bah, beep, bah, going to be further apart in my auditory cortex. When we get to the sense, somatosensory, if you touch somebody on their ring finger and on their index finger, those are going to be processed pretty close. But if you, then you touch them on their kneecap, it's going to be a lot farther away, just in terms of where in the cortex is that information being processed. So when I'm talking about mapping, I'm kind of talking about what is this kind of correspondence between how the stimulus is kind of laid out and where is it being processed in the actual kind of geograph geographical layout of the cortex. Um, so back to this top-down control. So obviously there's information about what the cat is seeing that's going up into the higher brain centers. But then there is also a lot of neural pathways that are coming back down that are actually influencing the behavior of the visual cortex. Um, again, one of, the big, one of the examples that I'm more familiar with is the idea of covert attention. Um, covert attention is this idea that you are paying attention to, some, but, to something, but you don't really want people to know. Um, you know, it's, it's harder to do again in the Zoom world here. Um, but let's say, let's say I, I'm, I'm looking straight ahead. I should have, uh, oh, here. Like, you know, here's Elsa over here. And I'm like worried like Elsa is up to no good, but I don't want her to know that I suspect that she's up to something. So I'm not looking at her. I'm just looking straight ahead. I'm talking to you guys on Zoom, but I'm kind of paying attention to what is she actually up to over there, way more than I would have normally. And that's what we call covert attention. I am not paying attention to her in this obvious way, but I am mentally putting more of my resources to pay attention to what's going on over here, even though I'm looking straight ahead. And what people have found in, through these brain imaging studies is that when you do that, when you allocate attentional resources to a different part of your visual field, you actually kind of remap exactly how much of the cortex is being dedicated to one part of space or another.
So this is, there's kind of this dynamic thing going on where your, your um, attention actually changes kind of how the raw information is even assessed and how much of your you know, neural resources are being allocated into um, one part of visual space or another. So just kind of putting that out there, that it gets more complicated. It's not just a flow of information from the bottom up, that your intention, your attention up here actually can affect how you're actually just taking in the raw data about the world. So it's, it's, it's kind of trippy. Um, th does that make sense? Um, so, and I'm realizing I was talking like, could people see see the little corner, the little me on the little picture? You kind of got the idea. Okay. Um, okay. So, visual. Primary visual cortex, visual association areas. You have similar things, you know, for auditory. Um, auditory, though, is going to be in the temporal lobe. So if I look at my brain here, my primary auditory cortex is up here in the temporal lobe. Um, there's also going to be this mapping, um, what we call tonotopy, mapping of tone, where high to low pitch are going to be located at different locations in a kind of regular way as you move along the cortex. Um, then there's going to be, you know, auditory association areas. Because obviously you don't just hear bips and beeps and frequencies. You know, you hear my voice, you hear clicks and you hear the wind and you hear a cracking branch and you heard your cat meowing and those, it's, it's really, we'll talk about this in more detail, but it's really kind of a complicated problem. You know, your eardrum is a single thing that just vibrates back and forth that is responding to the sum total of every noise in your environment, right? Whether I'm talking and a cat's meowing at the same time and somebody's clicking on some stuff at the same time, you can still know like, oh, there's his voice and there's some clicking and there's a cat meowing. But you just have one summed up signal of everything turning into one kind of complicated vibration of your eardrum. And yet you are able to like somehow disentangle all of that and create, you know, oh, it's a voice and a cat and a clicking stick. So again, this idea, you know, auditory objects, just as we kind of create visual objects, we don't just see splotches of light, we see stuff. There's, and there's a hand and a hand in front of an arm and whatever. You know, you also have this idea of auditory objects. So you walk into a room, you hear different people's voices and footsteps, and you've disentangled all of that information into things that are actually useful to help you kind of navigate and understand your world. Um, what else? We can go into the somatos. So this place here that I said was the post-central gyrus. This is also what we call my primary somatosensory cortex. You know, that's where your sense of touch is being processed. This was at Penfield back in the 50s. This, you know, mapped this out, took a little electrode and moved it along 
the different um, parts of this area and found like, oh, the subject's feeling something on their finger. They're feeling something on their arm. They're feeling something on their leg. So he actually, again, this mapping, you can map the body out onto this cortex as well. Um, and again, there's gonna be association areas as well for this, right? I am not, I'm holding my stylus here. I don't just feel like, oh, there's touch on this finger and that finger. It's like, it's smooth and it's round and it's, you know, I have these more kind of complicated interpretations of what that raw data really means in terms of, you know, using it in a useful way to interpret the world. Um, post-central gyrus. The pre-central gyrus This is my primary motor cortex. Again, the same guy who mapped out the somatosensory cortex. Somato means body, so touch. Somatosensory cortex is kind of touch on your body. Um, when they mapped out this primary motor cortex, they found it twitched different parts of the body. Um, people have now realized it's a little more complicated than just a pure like operate a muscle, but at a first approximation, that's kind of what it is. You can electrically stimulate any particular part of this and there'll be a predictable part of the body that is gonna move. You know, and then again, there's going to be the motor association areas. Also sometimes called the premotor areas. Because again, you don't think about, I need to, I need to like operate biceps brachii. It's like, it's like, I'm going to reach over. I want to touch this. And you think about kind of the big picture of the movement, but in reality, it's got to get broken down at the deeper level of control. If I want to reach forward, I need to like, there's serratus anterior moving this. There is um, triceps brachii straightening out my arm. There's actually my abdominal muscles leaning me forward. There's all sorts of crazy, crazy complicated control to actually make my body do what I want it to do. If you're actually looking at the over 600 muscles that you actually have to control and contract or relax to actually make the body do what you want it to do. So this kind of motor association area is where a lot of that motor planning is going on, where you actually kind of do the calculations to figure out what do you actually have to do at this real rudimentary level of muscles yanking on the skeleton to actually reach over and grab my iced tea and cool down on this hot summer day, right? So it's motor association. Um, both the motor, primary motor and primary somatosensory have a mapping from the cortex to the different regions of your body. Um, this word they call the homunculus. Means little man. It's like if you, in fact, I should just, let me do, a, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I share my screen, share, yes. Free Google images, homunculus. And these are kind of the classic images of the homunculus. Um, you know, this is supposed to be the motor cortex going along the primary motor cortex, pre-central gyrus. This is going along the post-central gyrus, and you can see the different parts of the body, you know, are mapped onto the different specific regions of the cortex. And again, if you take an electrode and you just stimulate along, if I do my annotate tool here, 
you know, if I took an electrode and I stimulated here, I'd feel something on my hand. If I took an electrode and I stimulated here on the motor cortex, I would be wiggling my toes. So there's this kind of mapping to a specific region to what part of the body it's either getting sensory information from or controlling the motor stuff for. Um, as you can see, it's not, um, it's not all distributed in a even way. Some parts of the body get way more cortex than others. Now what part, just from looking at this, what part of the body tends to get a lot more cortex than other parts of the body? The face. The face. Face, hands. The hands. So the face and the tongue and, the, you know, so this is, if you think about it, this is all about communication. Like how you, in order to talk to, you know, moving your tongue, we're gonna to talk about it, it's complicated. Your hands also, where you need a lot of, a lot of, real estate, a lot of neurons to do the really fine motor control or the really fine touch perception. So you have a very, um, you know, in fact, I'll go to um, one of the, it's pretty funny. Let me um, need to clear this. Here it is. Clear. Turn this off. If we go back, you know, somebody made a little picture of you know what would a person look like if they're you know if the size of the different body parts were the same as the amount of the brain that's actually dedicated to those different parts you know as you can see like the face and the mouth and the tongue and the hands are really disproportionately represented in the cortex so you know and this is what they call the homunculus. And again, it's another example of mapping of how the physical world, in this case, your body is represented on the cortex. Um, so that is that. And then where are we? You know, just for, you know, so I think we are at 11, 1229. So I think that is going to be, I'm going to honor the, the boundaries here. Um, we're going to say, let's call this strike. What do they say? Strike the set and call it a wrap. And on Tuesday, we still have a little more cortex to talk about. We got to talk about the prefrontal areas, which are, you know, where you do all your kind of executive control, decision making, impulse control, things like that. And we'll get also deeper into parts of the cortex involved with like language and things like that. Um, but otherwise, I, this is Thursday. If you have not, this is, I just got my ballot in the mail. Make sure you, make sure you vote. Make sure you, if you haven't got registered, make sure you do register. Otherwise things don't get better.